You are listening to a free version of Majority Report with Sam Steeter. To support the show and get another 15 minutes of daily program, go to majority.fm, please. The Majority Report with Sam Steeter, where every day is casual Friday. That means Monday is casual Monday. Tuesday, casual Tuesday. Wednesday, casual hump day. Thursday, casual thurs. That's what we call it. And Friday, casual Shabbat. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. It is Friday, July 19th. 2019. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. You're trying to say it the old way today. Ben Dixon, the Benjamin Dixio, also on the program, House votes to raise the minimum wage. Donald Trump disavows himself and his racism. Anthony Scalia's son nominated for labor secretary. The good news? He did not give a sweetheart deal to a child sex trafficker. Meanwhile, DOJ prosecutors once again decide to not charge the president in the hush money crime because the president is above the law. Also on the program today, Trump wants to zero out refugee admissions to the country. And Trump's EPA has got no problem with a pesticide that causes slight neurological disorders in children. 500 troops to Saudi Arabia and Sean Hannity's bid for war with Iran. Meanwhile, Iran offering inspections for another nuke deal. And the lineup for the Democratic, next Democratic debate is out. And lastly, John Delaney's own paid staff says, fire us. All this and more on today's program. Uh, getting a little bit of feedback, Brendan. I'm not sure exactly why. Sending some stuff back to me, but I think we should be all right. Um, obviously quite a crazy week, uh, this week, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm getting a little bit, uh, you're sending a little bit of a signal back to me, Brendan. I don't know what's going on with that. Uh, you there? Yep. Okay. Um, crazy week this week. Now I can't hear myself. It's weird. Um, all right. Yeah. Don't do that. Uh, a lot of stuff to, co- to cover this week. And I'm getting a feedback now again, Brendan. Are you there? I'm here. I don't. Okay. Yours, your zip is up. Okay. Everything's normal on our end. Okay. All right. Well, uh, be that as it may, we're getting a little bit of feedback, but I'll be all right. Um, crazy week. The uh, Democrats, of course, have passed the, the minimum wage. It doesn't mean much, but it's good. I don't know why Nancy Pelosi is... Um, Excited about something that's going to die in the Senate when that has been such a problem in the context of impeachment. But I guess uh, in this context, it doesn't uh, really matter. Um, Let's go here. Well, let's play this uh, sound. Uh, Donald Trump apparently uh, is disavowing everything he had to say the other night at the... um, campaign rally Trump 
President, if I may, when your supporters last night were chanting, chanting, send her back, why didn't you stop them? Why didn't you ask them to stop saying that? Well, number one, I, I think I did. I started speaking very quickly. It, it really was a loud — I disagree with it, by the way. But it was quite a chant, and uh, I felt a little bit badly about it. But I will say this, uh, I did, and I started speaking very quickly. But it started up rather — rather fast, as you probably noticed. There you go. <laughs> rather fast. Rather fast. Um, I, I was talking, I really felt bad about it. What happened was it was so fast in the auditorium, and they were speaking about the Jews in a way that was so extra. Yeah, they got the way out in front of me. Um, <laughs> That's what it was. It's almost like we were supposed to wait on that a couple of months. Meanwhile, it's not just, you know, Donald Trump doesn't. Uh, it's not Donald Trump's problem. It's uh, it's also uh, it's his 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 followers that are the problem here. Um, here's a clip of a Geraldo trying to defend him. It's clip number four. Go back to where you came from is the old racist trope that all of us uh, uh, ethnic or racial minorities have grown up with at various times. It is unforgivable uh, at this day and age, and I, I really lament that it came up. I'm glad the president has said what he said, and I think that the crowds, if you love this president— then don't ever do that again at one of his rallies, because what you do is you diminish him. He is the glue that holds our republic together. He is the man that makes e pluribus unum work out of many one. We cannot ever fall back into that lazy kind of the other uh, that, uh, that we did for several days. There you go. To be the problem is his followers. I don't want to say to be I hate the phrase, in fact, to be fair, but I, I in this case, as I watch that with the sort of like, you know, the slobbering over Trump, that to me is the, you know, he gets everything from Fox. Please stop doing this message. Not, you know. Are you saying Geraldo is yeah, sending that message? Too? That's my interpretation. I'm, I have no brief for Geraldo, but that's how I read that. Uh, I think Trump, it, it, it's it's impressive that Trump walked it back because, you know, he enjoyed it. Loved it. Of course. It's, uh, it's uh, shocking. I still, I, I, it's, it's shocking. Super disturbing. Uh, we'll talk more about that with uh, Ben Dixon. Hey, folks, whether it's a trail of muddy footprints or a pile of dishes after your first barbecue, nothing cleans this, like uh, the spring scents from Grove. Grove delivers natural brands you'll love, like Mrs. Myers, Seventh Generation, Burt's Bees. Grove straight to your doorstep. And everything is healthier for you and the planet. Plus, it really works. I get a bunch of that. Uh, most of the stuff that we have, the non-scented, the non-scented uh, hand-washing stuff that we have in the office, I get it all from Grove. Yep. What's the name of that? What is it? Is it the Seventh Generation, or what is that? I think that was Myers. One. No, I don't think it's Ms. Myers. I'm not sure which one Method. it is, but it, we get it all from the Grove. Um, now, listeners can take advantage of this exclusive spring offer. When you place your first order of $20, get a free three-piece cleaning set in your favorite limited edition scent, peony, lilac, or mint. I would go with mint. I'm not going to do the lilac or Same. the peony. You know the problem with that. That includes uh, Mrs. Meyer's Spring Hand uh, Soap, a Mrs. Meyer's Spring Dish Soap, a Mrs. Meyer's Spring Multi-Surface spray, uh, spray, a Glove Collaborative Cleaning Caddy, and a Grove Collaborative Walnut Scrubber Sponges. Plus, get a 60-day VIP membership as well as a surprise bonus gift. Just go to grove.co slash majority to sign up and place an order of 20 bucks or more. That's grove.co, not com dot co slash majority grove dot co slash majority 
And also, folks, as you know, it can be hard to find the time to sit down, read a book, and learn more. But there's an app that can change that. It's called Blinkist. Blinkist is the only app that takes the best key takeaways, the need-to-know information from thousands of nonfiction books, condenses them down to just 15 minutes for you to read or listen to. Blinkist is made for busy people like you who want to get the main points quickly without reading the entire book. And its audio feature, Blinkist, makes it easy to finish a book during your commute, on your lunch break, or while you exercise. In fact, 10 million people are using Blinkist right now. It has a massive and growing library from self-help to business to health and history books. I mean, for me, I love it because I don't have time to read, particularly, you know, like the self-help books. You don't need all the sinew. No. You want to go straight for the bone. Straight to the bone. Give me efficiency you want, you want the, you don't, in my efficiency. I, I, don't need, I don't need the pros. Right now, for a limited time, Blinkist, and you've, uh, Michael has been, has really gotten down a four, four day or four hour work week Hell, from Tim Ferriss. Oh, you know what? I, I can't even indulge in that joke because if only it were so. I think you feel like you've got it down to like a quarter hour work week. A quarter hour work week. Right now, for a limited time, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash majority to start your free seven-day trial. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, dot com slash majority to start your free seven-day trial. Blinkist.com slash majority. You get uh, titles like... Check out some of these titles. Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Hello. How to, how to Win Friends and Influence People. I should Check. probably brush yeah, up I on would, that. Yeah, I would. Speaking Carnegie of, one. there you go. Yep, that's um, yours. Fast track that, Sam. The Power of Habits. Factfulness. Ten Reasons We're Wrong About the World. And Why Things Are Better Than You Think. Hmm. Fire and Fury. That's the one I got to check out. All right. Look, we're going to take a uh, quick break. When we come back, Ben Dixon will be with us. Sam, are you still getting feedback? Yes. I don't know what the problem is. It's a real problem. Everything is down on your end. The auxiliary in the monitor is not sending back to me. Wherever the zip is, get rid of the auxiliary and monitor. You know what I'm talking about? Brandon? Brandon? Brandon, can you hear me? Okay. Do you, do you know what I'm saying with the auxiliary and the monitor? On the phone, it's a pleasure to welcome to the program the proprietor of the Benjamin Dixon Show, Ben Dixon. Ben, welcome to the program. Sam, thanks for having me, man. It's always a pleasure. Um, I have no idea where to start this week, uh, Ben. <laughs> it's been a week. Um, it, it, it seems like uh, ages ago, but uh, the week started off with Mike Pence basically parading in front of a room full of caged men uh, inspecting the, oh, wow. the, the tower. I mean, can you believe that was that was only five, six days I, ago? I honestly thought I, I would have thought that was two or three weeks ago by now. Um, and it was almost the I think the, I, I mean, frankly, I think it was the launch of the um, the the 2020 campaign mm -hmm. for for the, uh, the 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 Trump administration and they rolled out all of the various i guess shades of racism uh that 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 they have in their arsenal and uh by the end of the week i think we basically saw the entire um the entire campaign play out 
<laughs> yeah, I, I have to agree. This is definitely the way that they're going to run the entire campaign. And what's, what's so uh, wild about this, Sam, is that um, – a couple of things. Number one, it's effective. It's going to work to a certain degree. Now, whether or not he wins, that remains to be seen, but it rallies is his base and the Republicans um, who might feel a little squeamish about it. They go along with it. And so it's, it's really his path towards victory. Um, if we're not careful, the other side about it is it's so potent that it does have the potential of dividing the country in a way that we've never seen in our lifetimes. Um, and and uh, he seems to have no remorse whatsoever, not even this afterthought about what this type of campaign will do to democracy here in this country. Oh, God, no. I mean, uh, and we, we'll play this clip later. I don't know if you saw this clip of um, of Trump talking to this uh, uh, Yazidi uh, woman um, who uh, Nadia Murad. And um, it's I mean, this guy doesn't care at all. <laughs> and, I, I mean, <laughs> it, and what I think is really um, sort of stunning is how little it appears that the rest of the Republican Party does. I mean, yeah, I mean, we're, we're talking hundreds of lawmakers and yeah. uh, you got I think what we have four people who voted with the uh, the Democrats on this condemnation. And I think that was before the uh, that was before the rally. Wasn't it? <laughs> ben, are you there? Sorry. Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're breaking up a little bit. I am here, Sam. I, I mean, I think that was before the rally, okay, can you hear me? wasn't it? Yeah, I do believe that that was before the rally. Um, and um, the, the the fascinating thing about this one, Sam, is that is is that the Republicans not only are going along with it, but they're doubling down on it. Like um, Lindsey Graham, right? For instance, Lindsey Graham is doubling down on Donald Trump's ignorance uh, and on his bigotry. And, and we're finding that like throughout rank and file uh, Republicans who would have at least in, in 2016, prior to 2016, they would have at least tried to give the appearance of not being outright open bigots. Uh, but now Donald Trump has provided sufficient cover for them to just live their best racist lives. Um, it, 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 I, I don't know. It, it's pretty stunning. And I, I, uh, we had a, uh, an attempt to, I guess, impeach the president or start impeachment proceedings, uh, proceedings. I guess this is on Wednesday now. I don't know. Time is completely dilated for me. Uh, but it was, um, uh, the, the motion for impeachment was, tabled essentially it was a procedural vote uh and it basically um you know put it to the side i have a feeling they'll come back and take another bite at that at apple a little bit later um i i you know on some level it i i mean i i, I don't know i mean i, I it, it's 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 really sort of uh, it's a scary scenario we're 15 months out one can only imagine you know, he's got to escalate this, right? I mean, he's going to because, I mean, that's just the nature of the way that Trump works. And I feel like for uh, years I've been telling people it's going to get worse before it gets better. And I still think that that's the case. Yes, yeah, it was hard to imagine. Right. Uh, with some of the things that Donald Trump was pulling over the last couple of years, it was hard to imagine how it could get worse. But with this with the launch of this campaign, he has. I don't know. He, he's really found the one way that we could rip ourselves apart at the seams. Like I, I cut an entire point. I did a video this week and I cut an entire portion out because I didn't want to seem too grim or too fatalistic. But I cut the portion out because I really said, I don't know how we come back from this. Like, how do we as a, as, as a nation come back from what Donald Trump is getting ready to do with us? And that was Monday. <laughs> I had no idea that the week was going to get so much worse. I should have just left it in there because really that's the question. If Donald Trump goes all the way with the campaign, the way he's talking right now, I don't know how we come back as a nation. Yeah. I, I mean, I, 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 there's going to be a lot of, I, I, I don't, I don't know either, to be honest with you. I mean, I think that uh, on some level, it's just a matter of uh, the, the idea here has to be that, they are just simply defeated, right? Like, I mean, I, I keep waiting for a broader, and maybe it's there, but I don't know how durable it is. I mean, it sort of feels like there has been a, um, 
a palpable shift in the media and in the mainstream understanding of of not just Donald Trump, but of the Republican Party? I don't know. I mean, do you do you feel that's the case? Sam, I lost you there for a second. Um, I, I don't I, I didn't catch that question. I, mind repeating uh, I was asking if you thought there has been like a palpable change in the the media or the 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 media's perception, I think, of the Republican Party. Um, I don't know. That's a that's a difficult one. Like, I, I would like to think that this week opened the eyes of at least a handful of journalists. But we're I mean, this week they had um, uh, Spencer, Richard Spencer on CNN. Right. right. Jake Tapper had him on his show. So I'm not really sure um, if there's go- if, if the change is positive. Right. You would think that it would be positive. There's some journalists who have come out and, and expressly calling what Donald Trump is. Uh, they're calling it for what it is. Um, but I'm not sure that the institutions, the media institutions are going to uh, play the role that they need to play. I think they're still trying to be. Um, quote unquote, fair and balanced and inevitably leaning towards fascism because they're giving Donald Trump um, cover in so many ways. Um, we had another situation where the prosecutors apparently in the um, uh, in the hush money to, um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the paid during the campaign. Apparently, Donald Trump, it was released, was on the phone calls uh, about Stormy Daniels. And the prosecutors have now, you know, basically it's clear that to the extent that they decided not to bring charges, it was a function of this DOJ, um, uh, you know, internal ruling, essentially, Mm. their assessment from the Office of Legal Counsel. Remember, this is the same office, incidentally, that uh, said torture is legal. Right. And uh, on some level. And. It, you know, I I imagine that this is the assessment of the the DOJ. I it's never been tested at the Supreme Court, and I don't know who would have standing necessarily to bring this question to the Supreme Court. I imagine we won't find hmm. out until there's a Democratic president and the Republicans right. try and do this. Um, right. But where I I mean, you know. There's been different times where I feel like over the past couple of years and and certainly, you know, after the first like month or two, um, I I was a little bit less concerned. But you start to really see the creakiness in our system. Mm. And, you know, this week after Donald Trump came out and made those statements about Ilan Omar... Uh, Bill Barr came out and said basically the exact same thing in much more, I guess, polite words. And I don't know if you mm-hmm. saw that, but no, the combination of Bill Barr uh, coming out and doing that and basically saying, like, I am Donald Trump. I am defending yeah. Donald Trump, the individual, not the institution of the president. It really yeah. starts to make me wonder just, you know, sort of how... Um, smooth a transition of power uh could be in this situation i mean i you know like i i i know this kind of talk is a little bit there it's very easy to slip into some measure of hyperbole and when right. other people have articulated this to me in the past i've been a little bit um i you know have been a little bit uh i don't know i've dismissed it pretty easily but you start to see this stuff and we're we're 18 months out, and it's still it's it it looks a little difficult. Uh, what's your sense of that? Yeah, so that you really, my big question this entire week has been: How does America absorb this? How do we how do we adjust for this? How do we compensate for this type of uh, this type of leadership? Uh, because we see now the, the the creeks that you mentioned that are in our system. 
Um, Donald Trump was uniquely fit to exploit them. Um, anyone who has just complete disregard for our norms and our institutions, the rule of law, um, and they're able to win the presidency, they're able to exploit all of these weaknesses in our democracy. Couple that with individuals who are more loyal to the individual man than they are the institutions and uh, the nation as a whole. I mean, it is the perfect combination for chaos. And this is, when I say chaos, I mean a, 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 a chaotic transition of power, like you mentioned, but this is pre-campaign, like he just launched the campaign this week. Can you imagine all of those factors compounded with uh, the type of campaign that he looks like he's getting ready to run? And uh, I mean, I, I don't want to lean towards hyperbole. I don't want to be uh, a scaremonger, but I mean, it could get really ugly for America. Um, and we have a president who has zero regard for the type of chaos that he could cause uh, for America. Let's talk a little bit about the um, presidential campaign, because, you know, at this point, if and, and I just don't know how um, I, I, I don't know how Nancy Pelosi continues to justify this, frankly, mm -hmm. but um, that, you know, we're not going to see any legislation get passed, any legislation right. that we, you know, uh, are, are hopeful about. Uh, there may be some small things. I think there's some bipartisan agreement on the do not call registry uh, thing, and that's. <laughs> That's good to see. Right. And um, uh, Chuck Schumer, I think, is going to be able to maybe get us another uh, inch and a half on the um, uh, in our our leg room in our planes. That's not bad. Um, but uh, really, it's, you know. Uh, presidential politics take on a, uh, a an even a greater import, I think, on some level. I mean, I, you know. Obviously, people are going to have to get into the streets at one point if if it continues yeah. on this way. And, and I think, like, you know, organizing is uh, hugely important, probably yeah. uh, more important. But this stuff is it's it's fascinating. There was a poll uh, that came out, NBC News uh, survey monkey. And uh, the national numbers weren't uh, particularly, you know, shocking. Uh, they've been consistent with what we've started to see in terms of a trend. Biden at 25 percent, Sanders and Warren at 16 percent, Harris at 14 percent, Buttigieg at three and then at eight rather. And then O'Rourke, Booker, Yang, Castro at three and two percent. But here's what's interesting in terms of uh, the breakdown of of uh, of race. Uh, for white people, Warren is at 22 percent. Biden's at 21 percent. Uh, then Harris and Sanders are tied at 15 percent. For black people, Biden's at 37 percent. Harris and Sanders are tied at 14 percent. Booker and Warren at 5 percent. I mean, I got to think on some level that as Donald Trump attacks, like just becomes more and more racist and um you see these chants like send her home, right? Or mm -hmm. send her back or whatnot, that this could be helpful to a Joe Biden insofar as the um, there is a there's got to be like, you know, I, I mean, I think a, a big part of Biden's support has got to be a an association with Barack Obama for sure and b a perception that. He is the safest choice in some way. I don't happen to agree with this, but uh, but that he might be the safest choice. And, you know, for people of color in this country, you, you start to get into like this is an existential issue at this point. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you. I don't agree that he's the best choice to beat Trump. I, agree I think that is I think the argument there falls apart really easily when you see what Donald Trump is able to do with with Joe Biden's history. Um, so it, it, no one is going to have an easy road against Donald Trump. Right. Let, let's just start there. Uh, the third factor, I think, I mean, you know, the first two, I think the third factor is, is that Joe Biden really represents to a lot of people going back to normalcy. And I think that's fallacious, too, because there is no going right. back to a normal state after this. Right. What what, do, what Donald Trump has done to the country uh, has irrevocably moved us in a detrimental direction, 
but def- definitely towards the right. I mean, if, if we d- there is no going back to normal when he has had over 100 judicial picks um, that are all probably sycophants. Right. Um, his impact on the Supreme Court, uh, his impact on the national discourse, like there, there really is no going back to normal. So if people are looking for Joe Biden to be the safe bet and the bet to take us back to normal, I think that's a really bad bet. And I, I think the, the primaries are going to flesh that out for us. I think we're going to see a lot more. Um, Biden's not going to survive for a whole lot longer. Um, I, I, that's just maybe I'm wishful thinking here, um, but I'm, I'm counting on the primaries to really flesh this out for us. Yeah, I think that's the I mean, that, that's my sense, too. I just wonder that, you know, I don't know that a lot of Biden support. I mean, you know, we're, we're, we're still in a, a, a time period where people haven't necessarily fully engaged in yeah. the primary. And so I think it's easy for people to have those assumptions about Biden because uh, he was the vice president. Um, right. They released the uh, lineups for the uh, next Democratic debate. I missed the um, I don't know what you call it, the uh, the lottery that CNN did or whatever it mm. was. Uh, but on night one, Marianne Williamson, Tim Ryan, Amy, Amy Klobuchar, uh, then Beto O'Rourke, John Hickenlooper, John Delaney, who's incidentally it's being reported now that his own staff has basically said <laughs> fire us by August. Yeah. Uh, and Steve Bullock. So basically nobody's and Pete Buttigieg, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. And I'm just, let's just start with that. What kind of dynamic do you think that's going to create? Um, I, I mean, my sense is that Warren and Sanders it's too early for them to go at each other, but maybe yeah. that's not the case. Yeah. What, what do you think is going to happen there? I, I'd be surprised if they went after each other because they uh, both of them in the first debate, they, they both made an impact, but they both sat back and allowed everyone else to kind of mess over each other, uh, which is a pretty good tactic, in my opinion. They, they had a strong opening, and then they sat back a little bit. I don't see that they're ready to go head-to-head against each other um, because that's going to be a net benefit for, like, uh, Booty Judge in that kind of uh, scenario. So I think we may see, again, where they're both going to make strong statements. They may have one skirmish between the two of them, but I, I don't think it's going to uh, devolve into anything that's going to give uh, someone like Mayor Pete an advantage in that in that debate. So um, uh, other than those two, that it, it really, oh, Marion Williamson's, I, I just do have, I do have to say this about her, like as much as I'm, I'm not in favor of her campaign and I'm really not a fan of the spiritual guru types, right. I really do appreciate her running, if for no other reason than what she did to Dave Rubin <laughs> on his own show. That was worth, <laughs> that was worth it all. Yes, I think that's absolutely the case. Uh, <laughs> that was definitely worth watching. Um, I th- I'll tell you something. This first night is going to be fascinating, I think, because um, almost everybody on that stage, except for Marianne Williamson it, and, and Pete Buttigieg, let's put them aside for a moment. But when you talk Tim Ryan, Amy Klobuchar, Beto O'Rourke, John yeah. Hickenlooper, John Delaney, and Steve Bullock, they're all going to yeah. go at Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren on ideological grounds, right? And this is going to give, I think, both of both Sanders and Warren. And particularly Sanders, because he has the most distinct ideology, at least from a rhetorical mm-hmm. standpoint, uh, from Warren, right? I mean, she has made it clear uh, that she's a full-throated capitalist, but obviously needs uh, some reform. Sanders mm-hmm. is saying that we need a political revolution. This is going to be, I think, um, a huge opportunity for the left of the Democratic Party. Yes. Because yes, like absolutely. they couldn't go against, you know, here's the thing. Sanders doesn't want to go directly at Joe Biden in the first debate because some of uh, Biden's supporters have to come to Sanders at one point. Right. But they're going to be on stage with people who between one, two, three, four, five, <laughs> six of them, they don't even have, I think, 10 percent of the vote. Right. And yeah. so. He's going to go up there and, 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 and Warren, I imagine, to some extent as well. And they're going to have to a they're going to have to defend the, the left. And I think they're, they're, they're going to want to do actually even more than that. I think they're going to take this as an opportunity to Absolutely. really uh, explain why we need we cannot go back to the era of John Delaney and whatnot. And 
there's no cost for them to go at these guys, not necessarily as individuals. There's no point, right? But right. to go at their ideology because they will all be surrogates for Joe Biden. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I, you know, that's a great, that's a great way of looking at it. Um, and I, I also see this, this, this really may be the end of the road for a couple of those names. Yep. Um, it's particularly John Delaney. Like I do see he, he, he really believes what he says. And um, it, even though he's completely wrong, he believes it enough to jump out there. And that's going to be the perfect opportunity. Like you already said, that's going to be the perfect opportunity for Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren to just kind of make some hay, uh, both for the left as well as clearing the field. So I wouldn't be surprised if after this debate, um, we see a couple of those um, people from night one drop out. Yeah, I agree with you. And um, the other, I guess, you know, point that needs to be made about that, every single person on that stage on the first night will be white. Yeah, on, yeah, the, on, yeah. on the second night, um, um, we have Joe Biden, then Kamala Harris, Cory Booker, Julian Castro, Andrew Yang, Tulsi Gabbard, Jay Inslee, Bill de Blasio and Michael Bennett and Kristen Gillibrand. And that's also going to be a fascinating night because yeah. I would imagine the the theme of Joe Biden talking about how nice it was to have segregationists and this notion that. You know, everything's going to return to normal, right? That's Joe Biden's that's Joe yeah. Biden's uh, pitch that I'm going to return things to normalcy. And I have a feeling I would hope that um, half of the people on that stage, three quarters are going to say to Joe Biden, what makes you th- think after watching what we saw this week mm. and, and the reaction in the polls, let's say, to things like, um, you know, uh, that that you're going to return this to normal, like what yeah. makes you think that the we don't have a big divide in this country right now? I, I, and I think something else is, that's going to be exposed specifically because of that dynamic, right? The racial tension, the racial dynamic. Uh, night two, you have all the people of color <laughs> versus Joe Biden. Um, I think that night is going to expose that Joe Biden is not as tough as people like to imagine that he is. He's not that skilled of a debater. Um, He's not as quick on his toes as he's going to need to be to go up against uh, Donald Trump. If Donald Trump is nothing else, he is a witty um, he's witty with his comebacks. He can come back and really make you pay the price for saying something stupid, right? And and we're going to see that on, on night two. I think um, once people get a hold of Joe, because everyone's going to come after Joe, they have nothing to lose, everything to gain. And I don't think Joe is going to be in a position where he can stand his ground, uh, where he can actually make some hay out of it, like uh, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren would do for night one. So um, I, I think it's going to be a good night for America to really see yet again that Joe Biden is not up to the task. He's not the best bet to go up against um, um, what's Donald Trump. I couldn't even think of that guy's name for a second. It's been that crazy of a week. Yeah, it's going to be uh, I think these are both really uh, interesting sort of slates, to be honest with you. I mean, I suppose yeah. it, it could work that way. I would like to see at one point Warren uh, with Biden because Warren, uh, you know, has a particular portfolio that um, that that Joe. I mean, I think Joe Biden was one of the reasons why she got into politics. I mean, mm. like electoral politics on some level um, because of that bankruptcy bill. But yeah. um, this is a I mean, this is a very good situation, I think, from the perspective of people who are of the left in the Democratic Party, because um, we're going to see a, 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 you know, an opportunity for Sanders and Warren to go full throated against yeah. the um, the establishment politics, the, you know, the, the Hickenlooper, John Delaney, Bullock uh, yeah. uh, politics and the sort of the uh, emptiness on some level of the rhetoric of uh, uh, Buttigieg and O'Rourke, although, you know, Buttigieg, I think, is uh, far more adept at this stuff and, and maybe even has more substance uh, than O'Rourke does. But um, it's going to be interesting to see. Uh, and they're all going to come for, for Warren and Sanders. I mean, all of yeah. them. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, I don't know. I, I mean, I th- this week has has really left me in, in, you know, I think more speechless uh, than I've been in in ages. Like, I, I just, the uh, relentlessness of it, the, the nakedness of it, the, yeah. I mean, I suppose it's a good sign that Trump had to walk it back a little bit or pretend it wasn't him 
and that they've all they're all on board of this. Yesterday we saw, you know, we saw the beginning of the week Fox and Friends, because this is like the the uh, and and I don't want to elevate the importance of Fox and Friends uh, in the context of American politics, but when you want to get a sense of what the sort of like the 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 center of the right, the hard rights softest margins are that's fox and friends right like that's like their it's like the um it's like you know uh the it's almost like their cooking show on some level mm. and uh it's the soft ed- and and the yeah. way that you know they started off the week uh, saying that Donald Trump was being really comedic with his tweets yeah and then yeah. um uh they described the uh the the chant of sender back as like things got a little raucous and uh, mm. they were blowing, you know, the, the, I, I mean, we're we're at a stage now where it sort of feels like, you know, they um, they're not full throatedly denouncing this stuff. Of they're course, sort of yeah. like keeping the door open to go further. And yes, I, exactly. I get this sort of like feeling that, you know, six months from now. They're ju- instead of saying it was the crowd that just did this chant, they're going to say, well, I mean, let's face it. If she doesn't like it here, they should, they should go back. Right. I mean, think about this now. Uh, Newt Gingrich, former sp- uh, Speaker of the House, was on Fox News saying that exact thing. Right. So this is this is I, I'm not impressed by don't. Well, I mean, there was nothing to be impressed by. But the fact that he walked it back just an inch that that's that's his M.O. Like if he does something ridiculous. He will come back an inch and then watch next week. He's going to run a full mile on us and go in the opposite direction. Right. So the, his, his his you know excuse that the crowd got out of control or whatever. Um, next week, he himself is not he's probably going to double down on this because that's what he's done in the past. But that speaks to another problem, Sam. There is no more normal when so many of the Republicans in this country actually not only identify with what Donald Trump is doing, but are willing to go even further than Donald Trump is presently willing to go. So for anyone who thinks that we could just go back to normal without actually addressing these issues in a substantive and almost combative fashion, we've got to fight. We've got a serious fight on our hands. And part of the fight is not just economic. Yes, we do have economic issues that we absolutely must address. We have to go towards the left. We need social policies. We need Medicare for all. Hell, we need universal basic income. We need a lot of different things. But we have to fight the culture wars because this is where billionaires are pouring all of their money into. All these people you see on YouTube, uh, the Ben Shapiro's, the Dave Rubens, they're getting funded to fight the culture war. And we're seeing the result of that, not only from the YouTube contingency, obviously the the the, the decades long experiment or the tw- two decades long experiment of Fox News. It has all been about the culture war. And we have a significant portion of this country that not only buys into what Donald Trump is saying, they want him to go further. And there's no going back to normal if you're not ready to fight that head on. There's only a new normal that can be had after this. Well, you know, uh, Andrew Breitbart, um, who, you know, folks like uh, Shapiro uh, was spawned of, I guess, on some level. And, yeah. um, and uh, of course, you know, Bannon came in and was uh, more or less a partner of his, the Mercers. Breitbart's mm-hmm. big cri de coeur, I guess, was that uh, politics is downstream from culture. And part of that was just because of his own resentment that, you know, the, the guys in Hollywood didn't want to hang out with him. Uh, <laughs> and and, and, and uh, you saw it with Ben Shapiro, you know, had interest in becoming a, uh, a screenwriter in Hollywood and then, you know, obviously couldn't because he's conservative. And that's why he could <laughs> he could get a job. But um, this I, I mean, I think this is I, I think this is increasingly the case. Right. And um, I mean, that's. I, I mean, I agree with you. I think it's it's becoming it, it, there is so much of our politics uh, is par- this 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 culture war. They have been able to sort of activate more and more on the right. I mean, because this is yeah. you know, well, Patrick Pat Buchanan was calling for this in ninety three. Yeah. He was calling for it when, uh, on some level, it worked uh, under Nixon. Right. I mean, that was uh, Pat Buchanan's whole thing. We're going to split the country in half and uh, we've got the bigger half is what he said at the time. 
mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. um and 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 it worked then you know the the it, and maybe maybe it's becoming more extreme or more naked only in relief on some level that there is you know in the sense that like i don't know that attitudes were worse in 1972 it may be just that on the you know to the center to the left attitudes are better and so mm. there's a higher consciousness of this stuff or yeah. maybe they're getting more extreme uh because you know they're they're feeling that power uh diminish <laughs> i don't know i mean you, you, yeah I mean, the slightest amount of power loss, and they swear they are the most oppressed people in the history of all oppression. Um, but and never mind the fact that they're in power almost throughout the entire country. Can you imagine if white conservative men actually became a margin? I mean, marginalized community, they would be in the streets burning stuff down every single day. Uh, but to your point, um, I don't know that they're actually worse, um, but I do think that they're more indifferent uh, towards well, actually, let me let me start that over. I think there are less social ramifications because their reward structure, they have an entire reward infrastructure uh, that that actually rewards them for this type of behavior. I don't think that infrastructure was there as much in the 70s or the 80s um, where you could maybe you don't win an, a, a, an elected office. But you get yourself a nice commentary job making three hundred thousand dollars a year uh, if you can go out and say the most salacious and outrageous thing. Uh, So now they can be rewarded for their bigotry in a way that we went through a slight period. I mean, it was really just a really brief period in American history where you would be penalized for your open bigotry. I think we're in a place now where you could be rewarded because that country that they divided in half has all types of spoils to give to them. Do you think that. What we're looking at is, you know, 50 years ago, let's say 40 years ago, um, you know, you know, let's let's just peg it around the 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 um, the, the mid to late 60s. Mm-hmm. There was all sorts of structural support and, and not structural, but but um, structural, but also institutional support. Right. For racism, for white supremacy. Uh, legal support and mm-hmm. institutional support. The legal support for white supremacy, for the most part, right, not necessarily in practice, but in terms of the letter of the law, although right. that's been rolled back with the Voting Rights Act uh, and other things, but the, the, the legal support for um, white supremacy is diminished relative to where it was sure. 40, 50 years ago. Uh, The institutional support is probably diminished in some areas, Um, uh, maybe maybe across the board, but it's still pretty prominent in some other areas like policing, for instance, and uh, the carceral state. Um, And on some level that white people slash the Republican Party. Um, I mean, <laughs> yeah. honestly, I mean, that's that's a that's a, simply a factual um, uh, description of the Republican Party um, are are trying to regain what they lost from a legal uh, perspective and perhaps an institutional perspective in a cultural perspective. Hmm. I, I well, I, I yes. OK, I think I piece it together. You're saying what they lost institutionally, they're trying to make up culturally. Right. Um, and, and I think that they've done that. They've, they are successful in that they have a system. I mean, we talk about this all the time. They have a structure where they could take a no name, nobody, and they can elevate them to national prominence in a matter of a few days. Uh, you know, um, and so they have the cultural impact. They have the structure. They have they don't have institutions. They don't have legal institutions anymore, but they do have private institutions. They do have uh, think tanks. They have uh, outlets like PragerU and, and the Heritage Foundation, you know, all these organizations. I mean, countless organizations that can enrich someone and reward them for being able to make inroads in the culture war. If they can find right now, their, their latest move is the move towards um, uh, the pe- you know, collecting all of their people of color to do this work. Right. Because that's far more powerful than a white person doing all of this uh, is to have a person of color. So right now they have a Muslim uh, who will go out and deride Islam. They have a black woman who will go out and 
deride black people. I mean, they have so th- that is what they're making their inroads through, and that's how they're making it. And um, and I think that they see the value that even if we can't um, legally discriminate or even if we can't legally um, suppress, because really what this is about is protecting that white male power structure that Bill O'Reilly and John McCain were talking about on Fox News some years ago. It's really about insulating that power structure. And if they can't do it legally, they have found a way to do it culturally. Right. Well, next week's another week. I'm sure it's going to be just as horrible. I can't believe that that visit, um, that Mike Pence's visit was this week. I honestly, I, I have to go back and Google that because uh, you're right. Time dilation is hitting us seriously right now. I think those face app uh, where everyone aged themselves and gave their information to the Russians. Um, I think it really is far more accurate than we really want to believe because of the pace of our news cycle. I feel like I've aged. Um, well, I'm old, but I feel like yeah. I've aged even uh, more rapidly over the past. I don't know. 12 months for sure. Michael, are you going to, I'm going to say, Sam, you have been, you haven't my friend. <laughs> well, I appreciate that, Mike. I appreciate that. Even though I know it's not true, man, I've aged so much, man, this last two years have been really rough. And I just, I think it's been rough on a lot of American people. We we're going to have to have some PTSD uh, uh, treatment for most of Americans. Once we get past and get, Past this Trump stage and get to the new but normal. The thing. Wait, 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 um, I don't think, we're gonna have to adjust. But I don't think that's gonna happen, right? I mean, like, I don't think. I mean, I think that I. I just. I think there's gonna be a couple of months, but then I think Tom Cotton or whoever it is, is gonna come back, and and I don't. I don't think getting rid of Trump. It will. Yeah. It will maybe make it less telegenic on some level for a brief period of time, but I don't think this goes away. I, I mean, I, I, I think they're I think it's going to take um, it's some dramatic change and it's going to need dramatic change and time. Can I run one right. quick thing by you guys? Yeah, I, I think that this is another reason why very specifically and, I, you know, we're, we're still in the primary, before, you know, hopefully we'll never get to this point. But I, I think one of the things that's also so specifically destructive about Biden uh, is one, I think he could team up with Republicans to do things like cut Social Security and Medicare, which we've talked about. Yeah. And two, because I think he will be m- probably more than any other candidate on a continuum, uh, a-, a willing co-participant and these people taking a couple years to launder themselves and pretend they didn't do all this. Incidentally, before we get to 2022 and 2024, when they restarted up again. But he will be exactly the one to be like, yep, come to the White House. I know that was a weird aberration. And let's just pretend you weren't willing code participants uh, for this whole journey. We we, we could have pulled this uh, the other day. But um, Mark Sanford was on uh, Chris Hayes the other night. And Mark Sanford is 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 uh, contemplating a presidential run against Hay uh, against uh, Trump, against Chris Hayes and against Chris Hayes. And he said he he sort of implied this at first, and then Hayes asked him directly. He said the number one challenge facing this country right now is the deficit and debt. <laughs> and <laughs> and Hayes was like, "Wait, are you are you serious? Are you are you are you seriously saying that?" And he goes, "Yes." And then Hayes said, "Like." You guys are just going to pretend like that's the case when a Democrat gets in office. And the whole cycle is going to start over again. And I'm quite, I'm quite convinced. Of that. I mean, there was a story. Um, Rush Limbaugh. I was reading uh, somehow. I stumbled onto Reason Magazine. Rush Limbaugh was basically saying, like, yeah, don't worry about spending. That was just a trap that we set for the Democrats. Yeah. And he's going to snap back the moment um, you know Bernie Sanders is elected or Elizabeth Warren. Oh, is yeah. uh, elected or Pete Buttigieg is elected. These they're immediately going to be like the deficit and debt is the biggest problem that we have. It's going to be Weimar Germany and et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and Biden will do. will let them do. And I actually I frankly, that. I put yeah. Bu- yeah. Buttigieg on the side of that equation as well. I think he Buttigieg very well should do that as well. Yep. Let them launder it. Yep. I and this is this is why we have to have th- there has to become a new normal. Right. So when I say uh, get past Trump. I mean, we, we can get past Trump and go right back to the way things were. 
And because we don't have the infrastructure on the left, hell, not even the Democratic Party, as, as powerful as they are, they don't have the infrastructure to command the news cycles and to command the uh, the discourse the way Republicans do. Yeah. And so if we go back to normal, it will be exactly that. I mean, Republicans will just reset their 20 year cycle. And here we are. We're going to be fighting about deficits. But we have to get to a new normal, which is going to include shattering this entire notion of Republicans being fiscally conservative and um, shattering the notion that we have to worry about deficits because we've never worried about deficits underneath Republicans in the first place. And coupled with that has to be someone who's willing to fight the culture war on a level that can help us reset this, because if if not the Tom Cottons can come in the future. Right. But if we don't put some if we don't find a way to make it to make it um, socially unacceptable to be this open bigot and run these bigoted campaigns with loud dog whistles, with bullhorns, um, then we will just keep going further and further down this slippery slope towards fascism. I, I, the I. I I think it's that's why it's so important that, you know, at this point, the 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 project um, largely has to be to um, make sure that Donald Trump and the Republican Party are synonymous, that yes. there is no and and um, and, you know, not even argue necessarily that they're they're they, the, the Republicans lack fiscal discipline because I don't think that should be the, the fight. I think the, the point yeah. is, is that they're a, a the, 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 the Republican party is um, it's, it's broken. It is, mm. it is not a political party. This conservative movement is, um, is largely, I think just authoritarianism. And yeah. um, there doesn't seem to be any type of rational set of ideology that doesn't really involve, um, you know, the xenophobia and the racism. You know, there, um, you know, you don't hear people cheering like we want wages or <laughs> we want jobs or economic <laughs> development. Right. I mean, it is uh, misogyny. It is uh, racism. It's xenophobia. Yeah. Um, and you, you strip that away. There's just not much there. And it's, it's also at best a willingness to exploit these things for massive corporate giveaways. Absolutely. I mean, that's exactly it. Sam. Um, we, and, and I, I, I don't, I think that's a distinction in many respects without a difference. If you're willing to um, just walk by and parade in front of a cage full of men who who haven't you know who've been denied showers and a place to sleep for forty days, so that you know the EPA can uh, allow um, yeah. you know pesticide companies to use something for uh, that 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 hurts kids' neurological development. I, I mean. You're a, you're a racist, and on yeah. top of that, you know you're racist plus. <laughs> I, you know that that's that is the sh the sheer reality of this. The people in the crowd last, um, well, whatever night that was is at this point. The people in that that crowd, they may not even be cognizant. Some of them may be beneficiaries of of the corporate handouts that Donald Trump has given them, but the majority of them are there uh, because of the fury that Donald Trump is able to rev them up in, and and it and it goes one, it, it's hand in hand. It's it 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 is the what's the matter with Kansas. A scenario on on meth, right? It's like on steroids, and where where now they have they are clearly free to be their full bigoted selves, while their corporate overlords in the background saying this is perfectly fine for us because now we can gut every safety, uh, every safety net, every safety measure, every uh, everything that has ever given us progress over the last century. We can gut it while they're out there celebrating their racism. Yeah, I mean this. This you know, I mean maybe we need a uh, a a a some version of like crypto racism or neo racism <laughs> or utilitarian racism or something like that to describe. You know, uh, Donald Trump is really a nice guy at heart. He's not really a racist. Um, Mitch McConnell is <laughs> not really a racist. They're just using racism and uh, misogyny to, you know, um, provide tax cuts uh, for their people or to, um, to, I mean, like, just for the sake of, of bringing people on board, 
you know, maybe you need to put like some type of qualifier on the racism so that people feel more comfortable with it. Like, hey, we're not burning crosses on anybody's house. We're just basically <laughs> exploiting uh, the the um, the impetus to do that to uh, achieve corporate aims. Yeah, I, I guess my only question with that would be like, who who would we win with that argument only because they have a full throated acceptance of racism on the on the right. And then we have um, kind of this uh, this milk toast um, uh, approach from 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 um, Nancy Pelosi, from from uh, Joe Biden. I mean, the centrist Democrats, I, I don't know that they would even be moved by that argument um, just simply because of how they're reacting to Donald Trump. But the sentiment is 100 percent accurate. I mean, you're absolutely right. Well, can I just real quick one other just thing on this uh, that actually though correlates with calling out the disingenuous and and really and sort of ch- you know trash pseudo identity uh, things that are marshaled by disingenuous mm. democrats as well because the whole context of part of the drama with the twitter account and the and, and clearly them trying to get the AOC staffer fired was that He said, if you're a Democrat and you voted for a border funding bill without any accountability for the border system, that is functionally a racist vote, among many other things. And they went to immediately, well, Cherise Davids voted for it and she's Native American and the most, you know, (laughs) crass identitarian nonsense. And he responded and he said, well, you can be of color or yeah. any identity and, in fact, enable a racist system. And that is actually the deeper point, and that will implicate a lot of Democrats, as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely. I, I mean, and that's self-evident, right? I mean, Clarence Thomas. <laughs> well, that's the other thing. Well, they always want to, well, people want to always I'm not draw saying the boundary that where Davis, they want to draw. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not comparing um, uh, Sharice Davis, but it's on a sliding spectrum. Yes. Right? Like, yeah. and And there's plenty of data. I mean... This, you know, the uh, we we've talked about this. Uh, I mean, Eddie Cloud's book, you know, sort of walks through the the notion and, and others that for that matter that white supremacy is a practice, yeah. and uh, it is something that uh, it's not. You know, uh, white supremacy can be practiced by uh, any member of any race. I uh, you're you, you're conditioned in certain areas. I mean, uh, you have certain other agendas, but um, it it doesn't get worse than what we see. Well. Let me put it this way. It's yet to have gotten worse than we have seen this week in politics, at least in this in, in you know, the past couple of decades. I think it's um, I think we're going to see it get worse. Uh, so, Ben Dixon, uh, appreciate your time today, buddy. Uh, always hey, a pleasure. Always, always a pleasure. Thanks so much, Sam. Right. Mike, take care. Bye bye. Take care. Good to talk to you. It's actually nice to thanks for letting me jump in a little bit. I miss uh, talking to Benjamin. Well, you're you're welcome, uh, Michael. Everybody's calm down. Uh, folks, we're going to head into the uh, fun Post-roll. half in a moment. Yes, I've got it right here in my nice. head. Um, we're going to head into the fun half. Well, I want to remind you this episode brought to you by Blinkist. The Blinkist app takes the key takeaways, the key takeaways from thousands of best-selling nonfiction books and condenses them into 15 minutes. You can read them or you can listen to them. You can read like three or four self-help books just on the uh, treadmill alone. 10 million people are uh, using Blinkist right now. It has a massive and growing library from self-help and business to health and history books you can read the uh, the Fire and Fury. It's a great. Right? It re- I'm I'm absolutely a a wolf defender in the Trump era. It's a great book. Right now, you can get twenty five percent off your first year at Blinkist. Twenty five percent off your first year at Blinkist dot com slash majority. That's Blinkist dot com slash majority. All right, folks. Uh, just a reminder: this program relies on your support. You can support this program by becoming a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. For just pennies a day, support the program. And as a way of saying thank you, we give you um, extra content every day. We are going to be covering the uh, debates live. That's going to be in two weeks, I guess. Um, 
Also, uh, just coffee. Dot co-op, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY, get 10% off. As uh, Dorsey was discussing uh, earlier, um, check out the AM Quickie. We've been sort of reshaping it. And Do you like how I took that opportunity to turn that into a nice little plug, Sam? Yeah, that was yeah, very well done. There you go. Um, the uh, good things rise out of the tech problems. There you go. Um, yeah, folks, uh, check it out. If you have feedback, send us an email at majorityreporters at gmail.com. We have already made changes uh, based on your feedback. We will make more. And it's the show is only going to get better. I mean, we started out, and I um, fully subscribed to that. Uh, I mean, part of it is like that Tim Ferriss stuff from Blinkist, where it's just like, do it. Make it perfect later. Definitely. That's my, that's my new mantra. I don't have time to make anything perfect anymore. Um, that's basically what I did too with my kids. Just so you know, thank like, you for doing that because I was just kids. about to make a parenting joke about you and I thought that would be a little over the line. So I appreciate that you did it yourself. Thank you. You're welcome. Because it needed to be made. It was sitting there. Yeah, no, I no longer worry about dropping the ball with the kids anymore. I'm just You like, know what, Saul? Practice makes well further mistakes. Anyways, what are you gonna do? No, no, I tell them to practice. I just say that like I just basically say like look, as long as you guys are fed more or less, we're fine. I'm doing a great job. Sam, I just picked up a copy of uh, your. You, I think you just sent me a copy of the four stages of highly effective crisis management: how to manage the media, the digital age. <laughs> I, th- I thought it was literally the, the crisis in the office. <laughs> well, that's the point. I think. <laughs> that's the joke, and that tells you how to how to do the um, how to do the feedback uh, loop. On the on the board, um, Michael. Uh, today is Friday. That means that someday during this past week, the Tuesday must have happened. Tuesday was great. We talked with Daniel Bessner about reinventing human rights, the troubled history of so-called humanitarian intervention going back to the Balkans. I just will say quickly: this Sunday, we have an illicit history of the Communist Party in Sudan and a primer on what's happening there right now with. Ahmed Cabello, who's a Sudanese journalist. His father's on the Central Committee of the Sudanese Communist Party. It's fascinating. Next Tuesday, Crystal Ball and Joshua Khan. Uh, Michael Brooks show on YouTube and patreon.com slash TMBS. Crystal Ball. Crystal Ball. I haven't run into her in ages. Actually, uh, I'll be on her uh, her Hill show on Monday morning. Is it the Hill that that? that yeah, the Hill on? has the hills. The, she hosts a show, uh, Rising for the Hill. It's 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 good. It's actually it's a good um, it's a good morning. It's like it's it's not it's not a brief. It's a full morning show. It's a good morning. Oh, in other show. words, it's not competition with the A. Yeah, I was gonna. I was about. I was. I was. I was checking myself there for a second, yeah. but it, no, it's it's. Who did she do it with that guy, Buck Henry or somebody? Not Buck Henry. I don't think so. I'm pretty sure it's not. Um. Matt, uh, you can check out uh, the Antifada on patreon.com slash the Antifada. And you can check out um, uh, Matt's Literary Hangover on uh, on the YouTube channel and at uh, patreon.com slash literary hangover. And also, uh, obviously, all those things are available on Stitcher and iTunes. Uh, quick break. Right back with the fun half, 646-257-3920. We're going to take a bunch of calls today. You are in for it. All right, folks. Six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty. See you in the fun. Are you ready? What, who sent us this? Alpha males are back, 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 back. Boy, back. And the alpha males are back. Back. Just as delicious as you can imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 boy, back. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just want to degrade the white man. Alpha males are back.